Notice in your worship guide, if you would, and I pray you have taken it and also turned to Ephesians chapter 4, Pastor Brown read just a moment ago. And in that introductory statement, giving a current uh, illustration of even a football team has to increase its ability to play together and sacrifice together and understand together what the goal is and what their plays are. We must increase. Life demands that we grow. Whatever is that doesn't grow is dead. Paul's thoughts to the Ephesians focus on the idea of growing. All through this book, there are metaphors for growing, increasing, and they're all the same. The one word that summarizes it all is increase. You must increase to meet all of life's hurts and challenges, and we'll all have them. As Job said, man is born to trouble as sparks fly up. None of us will escape trouble, and let me give you this to write down in concrete. The older you get, the more your trouble increases. And the only answer for that is the more of Christ that needs to be in your life. I have to hand it to these philosophers like Nietzsche. Nietzsche was the great philosopher, the German philosopher, who said that God is dead. And all of us in the church gasp and say, how could he say that? We know this isn't true. But at least Nietzsche was honest. What Nietzsche did, this great pagan, atheistic philosopher, he faced the truth without God, and it only led to pessimism. Many of us who claim to be Christians say, oh, yes, God is there, but we don't face the truth. You see, facing the truth on this earth, knowing what man is without the gospel of Christ, leads one to despair and pessimism. You and I ought to face the truth and increase our knowledge of it that we may be proclaimers of the message. Think honestly. You must increase to meet all of life's hurts and challenges or they will decrease your life and rob you of joy, significance, and staying power. Now, in the text today, to increase literally means, according to God's counsel through the Apostle Paul, in this letter to Ephesus, this great church, this great city, three things that you'll notice in the outline. We must reject the baby life that most of us enjoy. Number two, we must connect to the truth life, wherever that is. And third, we must yield to his body life. It's absolutely clear and plain. Let's look for a moment, if we would, at this first idea. Reject the baby life and take your Bibles and look at verse 14. Paul says, then, then what? Then, after verse 13, after Jesus Christ has become the whole measure of your life. I know some of you here today would tell me, Pastor, I know you mean well. I know you're sincere. I know you tell me about the Bible, but it just doesn't live for me. I can't seem to get anything out of it. Uh, to set aside a time of an hour or so and just read the Scriptures is so far unto me. I, it's just a block. And I would tell you today two things. First of all, if the Word of God, if the Bible is not thrilling to you, is not increasing your life, is not a revelation of joy and hope to you, then you may not be a Christian. Because the only way anyone can understand the Word of God is to have the divine interpreter, the Holy Spirit, within him or her. The Word of God will never be clear to the unconverted heart. Paul told the Corinthians, the natural man or the unsaved man or the fleshy man discerneth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness. That's why the Bible, you say, may be good for some people, but it'll never work for me. That is the confession of someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Without a doubt, the first question every one of us should be sure we've settled before we leave this place today is that I have asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. He is my Savior. Although I don't begin to understand what happened when he died on the cross. I know he died. The scriptures say he died for me. I need help. My life is empty. Somehow the blood of Christ and Christ's suffering makes that real and takes me and will make me a new person. 
And although I don't understand it all, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you. I ask you into my life. I confess what I'm not. I confess my negligence. I confess the way I have ignored you. And I give my life to you now, forever. Help me. Now you say that, and you mean it. And I promise you on the authority of the Word of God and the testimony of millions of us who have come to know Jesus Christ, He will enter your life. Now the second reason you may not understand this book is that you know Christ after the flesh, not after the Scriptures. You have the Baptist Christ or the tithing Christ or the rules Christ or the person who led you to Christ Christ or your cultural Christ. And you don't know Christ after the Scriptures. That's the theme of the sermon next Sunday morning. But if you know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ and as you know you love Him, you want to follow Him and you can't understand this book, then you better get your thinking straight and that's really where we're heading today. You're an infant. Notice what happens to an infant. You see, then, I know if, if we don't know Christ, then we will be babies, infants. The word here in the Greek is very clear. It means little ones who can't say anything. In fact, the very Greek word here is the word we get mute from. We're dumb. We can't say anything. It's impossible. Little babies can't talk. They begin to grow and to smile, and even a little grunt would mean something. My uh, youngest grandson, a Hayden, can't talk. But when he sees me, his arms wave and his eyes dilate and he says, Ooh. Boy, that sounds great to me. <laughs> but I hope he's not talking that way 10 years from now <laughs> or we'll be in big trouble. You see, we laugh at children and it's cute. But what's cute at three years old isn't cute at 30. Or isn't cute at 40. And we don't need to be infants. In fact, what it says here, if you're mute, if you're not passing on your faith, I could walk out to some of you today. You may be 30, 40, 50 years of age. And I say, tell me something that Jesus Christ has done in your life this week or in this last month or in these last few days. And if you can't say anything, you're an infant. You're mute. One of the ways we grow in Christ is telling other people what Jesus has done for us. Perhaps that's one of the good sides. Pastor Brown will tell you we sure get beat up in this pastoral ministry business because of all the hurts of people. But one of the things it's driven me to is always have something ready to say about Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life. And if you're not telling people what he's doing, you're mute. And you're going to be an infant. And the word here are nautical words. The words here are nautical words, tossed and blown the waves, the hits of life. How many of you have been hit this week with something that really hurt? The waves. How many of you have suddenly found out this week you've been blown into a terrible decision that's going to have consequences that you wonder if you'll come out of? And Paul says here that if we really are going to increase our life, reject the baby life. Notice I've put in the outline here, if you've ever been air sick, try 40 or 50 years of being life sick. When I went through flight school, I got sick and threw up I don't know how many times. It's terrible to be air sick. A lot of people are life sick. They don't know it. Well, they're vomiting, but not physically. They're doing it to themselves emotionally. Life is nauseating. There's a secret nausea that just doesn't make everything right. And here's the answer. It's your choice. Infants are at the mercy of their circumstances. And the first step you can take today to quit being an infant, to quit being, taking all the hits, being tossed, and taking all the winds and the emotions that blow you here and there, is to decide, I'm going to start talking about Jesus Christ to other people. I'm going to cease being a mute I'm going to increase my ability to understand God and tell other people about it. Because if you don't know for yourself and tell it to others, you're not really a disciple. And there's a second thing, if you'll notice. We must reject the baby life. We must connect to the truth life, verse 415. Instead, speaking the truth in love, 
we will in all things grow up into Christ, who is the, uh, into the head, who is Jesus Christ, speaking the truth in love. See, instead of being an infant, you begin speaking truth in love. Most people speak the lie in bitterness. Be around the gripers and the groaners and the complainers and the negatives. They're everywhere, aren't they? There's always something wrong with something or somebody. Always. But those of us who know Jesus begin to speak the truth in love. Now, I've always kind of bounced over this. Oh, yeah, I want to do that. But you know what hit me fresh? I told you a moment ago, you ought to, always, ought to always have something fresh to say about Jesus Christ. Here's my fresh thing that I discovered this week, at least one of them. Speaking the truth in love. I'm so grateful that whatever the Lord Jesus tells me to do, he's already done it. And if the Lord Christ would decide that today that he was going to speak the truth without love, beginning up here, Paul, Marty, me, every member of the choir, we would leave this place and run and orchestra. We'd almost die if where we sit if Christ would really tell us the truth about what we are. We couldn't take it. If we really saw the truth, we'd be rather bleak about life. In fact, one of the things I've discovered as I've grown older in life is that life is primarily an issue of you and the truth alone and having to make a decision about God, see? Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't tell you the truth about what you really are? All at once, now, he'll tell you, the more we seek him, it'll come, but it's speaking the truth in love. Don't drop on a person more than they can handle. Don't put on another human being what only God is capable of understanding. Speak the truth in love. Oh, be patient with everyone around you as a father is patient with you. Now, that comes from being attached to the head, to Christ. Notice verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things then grow up into him who is the head. All things come together. My marriage comes together. My relationship with my wife, with my husband, with my children, with my grandchildren at work, in my job, with my money, in my time, and what I should do for other people, how I should handle my hurts and my wounds and my betrayals and my agonies and my fears and my failures and my guilt. All of it comes together as we hear him speak to us in love. Always the truth that shatters, but also the truth that lifts up. See? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm thankful I have a Savior like that. Grow into Christ the head. Where do thoughts like that come from? They come from his mind, the mind of Christ. That's why Paul said, let the mind of Christ be in you in Philippians chapter 2. Notice what I've said here in the outline. Increasing or growing into the head gives us a mind that will see all things as they really are. You and I will never see things as they really are until we see them with the eyes of our Lord. Tasting the wonder of union with others in the true God increases our motivation to abandon everything in life but the will of God. That's why you are so important to me. That's why I want to be important to you. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to overcome and to love one another as we ought to as members of one another. One of the scriptures says it just a moment. We are members of the household of God both spiritually and practically. Unless I learn how to accept Marty and to love him and to move with him and to see how God wants to grasp, uh, graft us together. Jim, unless I, you and I see how God wants you to become a part of these people and you're going to allow them to be part of you. Bill, same thing with you. Every one of us. You see, that's the thing that makes the difference. That's the will of God to be with people who are going somewhere for God. Where would you have chosen to be when Moses left Egypt? Would you have stayed or gone with Moses? Moses was leading the people of God of their destiny. Sure, a lot of them fell out. Sure, a lot of them didn't make it. Sure, a lot of them disobeyed. But that's the crowd I want to be with. Sure, a lot of them look terrible. But don't leave me in Egypt. Some of the people who criticize the church and, oh, we're worthy of criticism. I know that. We're failures. But at least we're honest about our failures or try to be, and we know where the answer is. Most of the world isn't honest, and they don't know where the answer is. Government and laws and rules and regulations will not save us. 
Only a heart response to the Savior will do it. I want to be with the people of God. This is the place here. We are members, all of us in Christ, of the universal body of Christ. But Jesus says you have to work that out practically with a group of people who have flesh and hair. You've got to look them in the face and live with them every week and get involved in relationships with them. You have to build a choir and build an orchestra and build a Sunday school organization and have people on the finance committee. You have to have people who rub shoulders together, who worship together, who study together, who try to help one another, who hurt one another so they'll come to the truth. And if this isn't the local church for you, then find one. Find one to be a member, a practical member of the body of Christ. I put the definition in here again of the will of God. Two of the greatest things I've well, one I've discovered this year, the other eye has been renewed. Notice what I've said here. The will of God is, first of all, who we listen to. It's not what we do. It's only then what we do. Who we listen to is the will of God. And then this little modification I've given of Gothard's idea. The will of God is what? Exactly what you would do if you knew all the facts and could see all the consequences of it. I find myself rebellious at that. Does that surprise you or hurt you or disappoint anyone in our musical world today? And thanks for that great choir number a minute ago, that great music minute moment ago. I have trouble. I honestly confess to you, I hope this doesn't bother you. There are certain areas of my life that I don't want to do what Jesus wants me to do. I struggle with it. And he'll reveal something, he'll finally learn it, I'll learn it, and I'll say, okay. And I'll say, I'm okay now. Then he'll reveal something else. And I'll struggle with that. I say, oh God, is that in me? Am I bad enough that it caused your son to be nailed like that to a cross? Yes. So don't try to hide it. Be honest about it. And be honest with people who want to be honest. This idea of being called to the head or tied to the head, who is Christ. When I was in high school, there was a very popular boy and named Bill Brewer. Whenever I read this passage, I always think of Bill Brewer. I think I was a sophomore and he was a junior. I was a junior and he was a senior. And um, he was very popular, nice looking, sharp, articulate, dressed well, natty and all the rest of that stuff. We had a game. I think we were playing Wichita Falls, and we had all the buses going to the game. You know what a big deal that is. And Bill happened to step out between two buses and wasn't looking, or I don't know what happened, but a car hit him, knocked him down in the street, ran over him. Of course, everyone was compassionate. Poor Bill. Everyone thought about Bill. And a few months later, he came back to school. Bill wasn't like what Bill was before. And he was very, very much messed up from his accident. And I can still see him today. He would hold on to this hand. And at first, everyone loved him. Good to have you back, Bill. But he was so desirous of being what he was before that he became, became obnoxious. And when a child becomes obnoxious, other children treat him obnoxiously. And we made up games, and he would come, and we'd say, Jesus, the gimp. We called him the gimp. And he would come and try to run us down and talk, and then he would be angry, and then we would hate him more and make more fun of him. And although I had just become a Christian then and had no idea of what was going on, Bill Brewer has given me the greatest image of the body of Christ of any other thing I've ever experienced. You see, I was too young to know, to understand what his parents were going through. I'm a daddy now, and I'm a grandfather. And now I can stop and think the anguish and the hurt and the pain and the loss and the despair that went on in that mother and daddy's heart because their wonderful, handsome son no longer had his body attached to his mind. And I think often of how the Heavenly Father must feel as he looks down and sees all of us here in the church not growing into the head, 
but living our own little independent, gimpy lives. You're going to have to make a decision, and so am I, that we're going to increase into the head of Christ and let him be our mind, not mine. Him. That's what Paul is talking about here. There's a third thing he says, yield to his body life. Notice verse 16, and from him the whole body is joined and held together. The Greek construction here is constantly being joined, constantly held together. It's something we never get enough of. It's nothing that's ever done completely. It's something we must work on. Accepting and agreeing Christ's heartfelt desire for us in these four areas. You've heard me. Well, pastor, there you come back again. Why do you keep coming back to this treasure and talent and time and truth thing? Because the Bible keeps coming back to it. The Bible keeps saying increase, increase, increase in these areas. There's no way that you will increase in treasure and talent and time and truth unless there's a costly giving. Notice what I've said here about treasure. In fact, I heard Larry Burkett this week who said, uh, if God isn't worth 10%, what is he worth? Our whole culture is under the pressure to get more and to be more. It's all out of control. We either trust God or say we trust God. Most of us here just say we trust God. We don't have the strength to cut back, do we? We don't have the strength to not even control a little money. Let me tell you, my friend, I have a little silver dollar here. If you can't control this, you're a fool to think you can control this. If you can't begin with the money, which is the easiest thing to control, relatively, you'll never begin to give yourself to other people. That's what talent is all about. Talent is giving yourself to others. And until we learn to control the material world, the money world, we'll never begin to learn to control the heart world, the relationship world. And we're going to be battered by money, by things, and battered by our emotions. It gets right back to what Paul said. We're tossed and we're driven. We're tossed and we're driven. And if your emotions and your money control you, your time will never be what it needs to be. Most of us here today have our time enslaved to things or enslaved to our feelings, and it's a lie. Paul says, yield yourself to the body. This next week, I think you'll get a mail out from the church as we finish this year. And all we're asking you to do, all the finance committee said, and the elders, increase your giving. Increase your giving. I don't care what you're giving. If you're giving $5 a week, increase it by 10%, give $5.50. If you're giving $20, give $22. If you're giving $100, give $120. That's a secondary thing. You see, the reason we talk about money so much is because you never take the first step. I tell you, if everyone in here was tithing and giving their treasure to God, you'd never hear me say a word about money except just in passing. I'd move this second point. Let's talk about your relationships. How can you really get to know another human being? And we could throw an anchor down here now, and you know it from the top left over here to the top right over there and right back here and to the back here. There is not a marriage in here that doesn't desperately need help in intimacy between that husband and that wife. Some of you are living in a marriage now that is as dull as your understanding of Scripture. And there's no life there. I used to wonder why men, why men had such a uh, casual attitude toward God's church. Why won't they give? Why won't they help? And finally dawned on me why they treat the church just like they treat their wives. And that's sad. Doesn't have to be. Because the apostle says here, yield your treasure, begin giving it. How much is a sacrifice? 1%, 2%, 50%, I don't know. But I tell you, if your God isn't worth to you 10% of what you come, your God isn't worth much. You say, well, I don't like the way that the church spends my money. Let me tell you something. God doesn't like the way you spend yours either. 
and you spend your money exactly like God wants you to spend your money, you come talk to me and I'll do what you say about how this church spends its money. I agonize over how our church spends money. Oh, I wish Jesus would just sit down and tell me where to put every penny, but that's for me to work out. Now, you notice the conclusion I've said here. These verses I gave about the church, they're in Ephesians. I hope you look at them. But the ultimate symbol of increasing on earth as well as in heaven was and is the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, totally placing his life in the hands of the Father. In fact, I made a mistake, and I hope you'll correct it. I didn't make a mistake. The word is there, commit, but I wish I'd translate it better from the Greek language. Notice the last thing in the outline. It says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That word better is yield my spirit. Yield my spirit. I'm not asking you to recommit. I'm not asking you to rededicate. I'm not asking you to make bigger vows. You're going to give more money. I'm not asking you, hey, you're going to, you know, pledge to do this. I'm not asking any of that. All I'm asking you to do is one thing, yield to God. As we sing this great, beautiful little song, as the deer pants after the water, so my heart pants after you. As we sing it, I'm asking all of us to yield our treasure, our talent, our time, and our truth. It'll come out in the great mix for which Jesus Christ died for each of us.